thing that I will say is, is if we have any technical difficulties over there on your end, um, you know, Mark, go ahead and, and try to jump up and stop me or something because, you know, I obviously don't know what, uh, what exactly is happening on that end. Uh, the one thing that I will say before I get started is if I, uh, if I get choked up or, or kind of start coughing during the presentation, I apologize. It's just because I'm, I'm really emotional about this particular topic and it's, it's not because I'm, I'm sick. I just, just want you all to, to know that. Um, so I always like to kind of start off with a joke, especially when I go to, uh, to other parts of the country. And so I'm sure you guys have all heard this before, but you know, where, where was the toothbrush invented? West Virginia? Well, we, we always like to claim it was uh, invented in Arkansas. And then obviously everyone knows why it was invented in Arkansas, because if it was invented ever, anywhere else, it would have been a teeth brush, right? Well, I, I appreciate the sympathy laughs. Um, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started with the presentation today. Um, you know, here in Arkansas, uh, our primary crop rotation is always centered around rice production. And I don't expect anyone to really understand rice production other than the fact that urea is the primary fertilizer source uh, that we use for our nitrogen fertilizer requirements in rice production. And the main reason for that is we rely very heavily on airplanes and aerial application in our rice production systems. And what urea allows us to do is have a high analysis granular formulation of nitrogen um, that we can apply via airplane. And it, it fits very well um, into our production and our management systems. And so, you know, knowing that, I hope you can kind of understand why, you know, at least here in Arkansas, we have done the amount of research that we have on ammonia volatilization losses um, and inhibitors and different management practices uh, that will help reduce those ammonia volatilization losses specifically uh, from urea. And so real quick, I just kind of want to give you a, an overview of our thoughts uh, primarily on nitrogen fertilizer management. Um, you know, management of no other fertilizer nutrient presents a greater challenge to the grower than does the effective management of nitrogen fertilizer. And likewise, no other nutrient can deliver greater benefits and increased grain yield for its effective management. So I think, you know, we all kind of understand this concept or this idea that, that nitrogen is the great magician, right? We put it out in one form one day, and the next time we come back, it's in a different form or it's disappeared. Um, and so it's, it's oftentimes very tricky to manage. And so, you know, a couple of other statements, uh, the many nitrogen loss mechanisms in the soil environment, coupled with the rapidity at which they can operate, you know, really punctuate the importance of proper nitrogen management. Um, when we look at all those different nitrogen loss processes, you can start to understand how competitive they are um, when you look at, you know, small or, or young uh, crop plants. Um, thus, proper nitrogen fertilizer management options available in crop production are based on our current understanding of nitrogen behavior in the soil environment and the nitrogen uptake characteristics of the plant. So specifically, when we start to talk about ammonia volatilization, you know, this is essentially the loss of nitrogen when we form ammonia gas. And there are a lot of different factors that are going to contribute to this. And what I would like to do in today's presentation is kind of go through and give you some, ex some specific examples of how both soil chemical and physical characteristics, as well as environmental uh, factors, are going to influence 
that ammonia volatilization loss potential. Um, and so when we look at this process, you know, either ammonium or an ammonium forming fertilizer is going to be our input. Um, ammonia gas is going to be our loss or our output. And depending on all these factors that we're going to talk about, you know, this reaction or this process can take from hours to days, uh, depending on the specific situation um, that you're in. And, and one thing I always like to point out to people is, you know, ammonia volatilization loss is, is or can be a significant loss pathway, not only for urea or ammonium-based fertilizers, but we can get a significant amount of ammonia volatilization loss from various manure sources, uh, depending on what uh, their composition is. Um, so when we talk, you know, about ammonia volatilization, uh, I think it's important for understand that if the conditions are right, ammonia volatilization can occur in all soils. Now there are certain soil textures and certain environments where you're more prone to ammonia volatilization loss than others. But if the conditions are right, ammonia volatilization can occur um, on any soil texture. <clears throat> um, you know, ammonia can be lost um, from plant foliage um, if it is surface applied, and that is going to increase as temperature increases and increase as nitrogen rate increases. So when we look specifically from fertilizers, typically if we apply ammonium-based fertilizers uh, to the surface of a soil with high pH and it's not incorporated, you know, that is the worst case scenario for ammonia volatilization loss. Um, if you look kind of at this reaction down here at the bottom, you know, this is essentially what's going to occur when we add urea, which technically is an organic nitrogen compound to the soil. It's going to capture or utilize hydrogen ions in the soil. It's going to use water, um, hence why we call it urea hydrolysis. And that first reaction step is typically going to be the formation of ammonium and bicarbonate. And if you notice here, this initial step in urea hydrolysis, when we consume these hydrogen ions, that leads to an increase in the soil pH. And so when we have that increase in the soil pH, we can actually um, convert it to ammonia gas, CO2, and water. And then obviously this ammonia gas can be lost uh, to the atmosphere via ammonia volatilization loss. So to try to get a little more specific, you know, there are a lot of factors that can influence ammonia volatilization. Um, these are, you know, a list, but I wouldn't say that this is all encompassing in the sense that, you know, there are going to be other things um, that contribute to ammonia volatilization losses, but typically these are the types of things that are most often discussed or, you know, researched in terms of the factors that are going to influence this particular process. So if we look just closely at the pH relationship with ammonia volatilization, um, this is a study that was taken at 77 degrees Fahrenheit. We have a pH of 8.0, and you can see that when we have a pH of 8.0, the relationship between ammonium and ammonia is dominated by ammonium. So here at the graph, you can see the pH of 8, we roughly have only about 10% of the nitrogen that is going to exist as ammonia gas. But when we move from a pH of 8.0 up to about 9.3, you can see here that we have a, a major conversion where now 50% of the nitrogen in the soil solution is going to exist as ammonia gas and therefore prone to nitrogen losses. Now, we're typically never going to see soil pHs um, in this range. You know, the main thing that I want to show you here is just that influence 
of pH on the conversion of ammonium to ammonia gas. So when we talk about nitrogen fertilizer sources, um, you know, urea is the main one of concern. It is the primary dry granular nitrogen source used in the United States, and it represents about 16% of the total nitrogen used across the country. I think when you get into certain um, areas of the country and certain production uh, systems in particular, what you'll find is that, you know, especially in the Mid-South where rice is a predominant part of our production systems, you know, this number um, is going to increase greatly up to as much as 70 or 80 percent of the total nitrogen used um, is going to be in the, the urea form and primarily that dry granular form. Um, you know, urea is a great fertilizer. Um, it has a high analysis percentage. You know, the one thing that I, I think limits, you know, widespread or increased urea use is that potential for ammonia volatilization loss and not really knowing, you know, when and, and how that's going to occur as production systems and crop rotations um, change. So we're going to go back to this kind of behavior of urea in the soil. Um, you know, the one thing that you have to understand in particular about um, urea conversion to ammonium, it is facilitated or it is catalyzed by an enzyme. And that enzyme is referred to as the urease enzyme. And so when you look at this particular chemical compound of urea, you know, that is a pretty strong bond between these amide groups and the carbon in this particular compound. And it requires, you know, water and this enzyme in order to cleave those bonds and generate um, ammonia. When we have a pH of greater than 7, What's typically going to happen in the soil system is we're going to have, you know, a conversion of this ammonium to ammonia gas, which then can be lost. Um, the one thing that I think is lost on a lot of people is that, oh, excuse me, the urease enzyme is really ubiquitous in the sense that it really exists everywhere. So microbes and plants both uh, generate the urease enzyme and a lot of times it's released into the environment and so in many cases this process of urea hydrolysis is what we consider an abiotic process so it, it can occur or it can happen um, without the assistance of a microbe or a plant and so there's urease all over the soil all over the plants so anywhere urea lands, that enzyme is typically going to be there and available um, to start, you know, facilitating this process or this conversion from urea to um, ammonia. Um, urea hydrolysis can be very rapid in as little as two to six days. And, you know, typically this is going to be driven by environmental conditions. Um, where we have warmer conditions, we're going to see an increase in that um, uh, enzyme activity, and we're going to get more urea hydrolysis. And, you know, the other thing that you have to remember is that in order to have hydrolysis, we have to have water present. And, you know, when we have moist conditions or high relative humidity, uh, that is going to increase the rate of this hydrolysis process. Um, we do see a marked increase in soil pH around the, ure the urea granule as that urea hydrolyzes, and that can actually exacerbate ammonia volatilization losses. So if we're in an acidic pH, um, you know, five and a half to six, this process of urea hydrolysis right there immediately around that urea granule um, can actually increase the pH and lead to ammonia volatilization losses in, even when the bulk soil pH is low enough that you wouldn't expect to get uh, those particular losses. 
when we talk specifically about urease activity or the activity of the enzyme, um, <clears throat> it can have kind of a feedback mechanism where free ammonium uh, that might be floating around in that gaseous form can inhibit uh, the activity of that urease enzyme. But if you look, you know, optimal production uh, for this particular enzyme is 60 to 7 degrees Celsius, um, which equates to roughly 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And there's a very significant relationship that as temperature increases, you're going to get an increase in this enzyme activity. And so the main reason I want to show you this is that, you know, this particular enzyme is very effective at high temperatures. And so, you know, the hotter or the warmer your environment or your climate is, you know, the more rapidly that particular enzyme is going to work and therefore the more likely you are to get ammonia volatilization losses. Um, the ideal pH for the activity of this particular enzyme is around 7.4. Um, so obviously as, as pH increases um, in the soil solution or, or wherever that urease enzyme is present is going to lead in, into an increase in hydrolysis, which then can promote ammonia volatilization loss. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of intuitive, but I think it's important to point out and remember that, you know, the, the work of this particular enzyme is significantly inhibited by a lack of moisture. And that just goes back to, you know, what hydrolysis is and the inputs required for that process to occur. Um, if you don't have a significant amount of, of free water available uh, for that enzyme when it is uh, converting urea to ammonium, um, it's uh, productivity or its rate of reaction is going to be significantly uh, slowed. Other things that we tend to see with this particular enzyme is that the rate at which it uh, functions tend to in, tends to increase as organic matter and clay content increases. And so I just want you to kind of keep that in mind when we look at some of the data that we'll see here in a few minutes. So specifically, you know, let's look at the effect of soil buffering capacity on soil pH and ammonia loss. And so what I'd really like you to do is just focus on this bottom panel of the graph. And what we have here is pounds of ammonia per acre that has volatilized. And we have three different soils here. Uh, so soil one is this top line. And it basically represents a soil with low buffering capacity. And another way to look at that is essentially a soil with very low cation exchange capacity. So this would represent some of our uh, very sandy soils, uh, coarse textured soils. When we look at this uh, middle line here, this is just soil mix two with kind of a moderate buffering capacity. This would represent more of our silt loam or loamy textured soils, where we're typically going to have CECs ranging anywhere from about 10 um, to 20 uh, centimoles of charge per kilogram. Then when we look at this soil mix three, um, it's represented by high buffering capacity, and you can see that line down here at the bottom where we have very little um, ammonia volatilized from that particular soil. And this is just due to that, you know, buffering capacity or cation exchange capacity of the soil. And this is going to represent a clay type soil. So, you know, typically 22 to 25 or greater um, CEC or centimoles of charge per kilogram. And so you can see here uh, what effect that soil CEC has on the ammonia volatilization loss potential um, from different soils. With <clears throat> coarser textured soils or soils with low CEC having a high potential for ammonia volatilization loss and finer textured soils or soils with a high CEC having a much less or lower potential for ammonia volatilization loss. 
So when we look at the effect of temperature and time on urea hydrolysis, um, this is just pounds of urea remaining. Um, so all we're looking at here is the decrease in urea. So this could be looked at as a loss of urea via ammonia volatilization. We have time here on the x-axis and you can see we have two temperature regimes. So 80 degrees Fahrenheit is represented by the red line and 35 degrees Fahrenheit is represented by the yellow line. And essentially this data just shows us, right, that as we alternate our temperature, um, we get a significant difference in the rate at which uh, urea hyd hydrolyzes. So if you remember back, we know that that urease enzyme can work efficiently all the way up to 140 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And if you see here at 80 degrees, in as little as four days, we have converted or hydrolyzed all of that urea um, to either ammonia or ammonia. Um, when we drop down to 35 degrees Fahrenheit, you can see that that process is much slower overall, but it takes as, as long as 10 days um, for all of that urea to be converted or hydrolyzed. I think there are a couple of different ways that you can interpret this data. Um, you know, part of why I wanted to show it to you was just to um, give you an idea of what that difference in temperature does to urea hydrolysis. Um, and we see that there's this difference between four to 10 days um, between the two temperature regimes. But I think um, it's very surprising. And one thing that you should note from this is that even when we have near freezing temperatures, you know, 35 degrees Celsius, we're still going to have conversion of urea uh, via you know, urea hydrolysis and that enzyme activity in as little as 10 days. So where we might think that, oh, you know, cold temperatures are significantly going to reduce um, urea hydrolysis, I think we could say that it definitely slows urea hydrolysis. Um, but in, little, in as little as 10 days, we can get all of that urea converted um, by that enzyme. When we look at the effect of temperature and time on ammonia loss from urea, this is just kind of another way to look at the same information. Uh, this is where 100 pounds of urea nitrogen was applied to a soil with a pH of 6.5. Uh, we have time on the x-axis and then we have pounds of urea remaining on the y-axis. And you can see our different temperature regimes of 90, 75, and 45. Um, you can see that there is a difference, right, in the loss of that uh, ammonia, uh, the temperature regime that's indicated there. Um, so we do get differences in how fast that urea hydrolyzes based on uh, those different environmental temperatures. So when we look more closely, um, and we, we're going to switch here, and we're just looking at one particular temperature, of 70 degree or 75 degrees Fahrenheit, but we're looking at different soil pHs. So in this particular graph, um, our red indicates our highest pH of seven and a half. Our blue represents um, our moderate pH of six and a half. And then our green represents our lowest pH of five and a half. So when you look across this particular time scale, you can see that the higher the pH, um, the more rapidly we have urea hydrolysis occurring. And then at the end of the 10 days, you know, we have roughly 50% of that urea being converted um, via uh, urea hydrolysis. When we go to pH 6.5, you can see that that uh, process is a little bit slower, um, but it's still going to have significant conversion at 10 days where 30% of that has been hydrolyzed. And, and like I mentioned with the temperature before, I think it's important to understand, and this kind of reiterates that fact, that ammonia volatilization can occur under a wide range of soil conditions. Because even though we know, right, that ammonia volatilization 
should increase as pH increases, um, we can't just automatically assume that on acidic soils we're not going to get any ammonia volatilization loss. And I think that's kind of what I want to reiterate with this particular graph is, you know, when we have acidic pHs as low as five and a half, you know, ammonia volatilization can still occur uh, because we're going to be undergoing that hydrolysis process. And, you know, in this particular situation, we're only at 10% uh, potential loss at 10 days, um, but 10% can be significant you know, when you're looking at um, in-season applications of granular urea to various uh, crop systems. So when we look at the effect of soil moisture and time, um, in this particular situation, we're still using 100 pounds of urea nitrogen, same temperature, and you can see our, our relative humidity is at 55%. Um, the two lines here just represent different soil moisture regimes. So this 35% or sorry, 37% is indicated in the red line and then the 5% is indicated up here on the yellow line. So when we have relatively dry soil conditions, you know, we're going to get very little urea hydrolysis because we know that water is essential in that conversion um, from urea to ammonium. Just a little bit of water, right, we're here at 37 and a half percent, so in some of our soils this is going to be just above like a, a permanent wilting point type of situation, and you can see just that addition of a small amount of moisture to the soil system um, leads to a much greater conversion of urea to ammonium um, as once again, you know, water is required for that hydrolysis process. Um, this is some work um, that was done basically looking at ammonia volatilization loss as it's influenced uh, by the time of day. You can see here um, we've got a, a bare soil where urea solution was applied and we have a mulch soil where urea solution was applied. And if you can see here, we've got very large diurnal fluctuations um, throughout the day where we get some of the highest um, ammonia volatilization loss early in the morning and it slowly decreases um, throughout the day. And then it, we get this increase again um, to early in the morning hours and then we get this decrease um, if you go down here to this bottom graph, what, that, what we're looking at here is essentially the gravimetric water content of the soil over that same time period. And so what this is showing is this is showing us that diurnal fluctuation in the soil, the surface soil moisture content. And this basically is what is controlling this ammonia loss up, up here on the top in these two different soil systems. So you can see as we get a drop in the soil moisture or we get evaporation of that moisture, that actually drives and carries a lot of that ammonia uh, from the soil surface. And then once it dries out, um, we kind of have to have, you know, nighttime increase in relative humidity, increase in soil moisture to kind of replenish um, that moisture in the soil so that when it warms up again and we start to get that evaporation from the soil surface, you know, that's going to pull that ammonia away. Um, so just to kind of reiterate, you know, urea is the primary nitrogen source used in crop production, especially in Arkansas because it's ammonium forming. It has a high analysis of 46%. And it's typically going to cost less per unit of nitrogen than any of the other ammonium fertilizers. But urea is obviously very prone to ammonia volatilization loss. Um, so when we look at the best condi conditions for application of urea, we're really going to look for cool and dry conditions. We want rapid incorporation either by tillage or with rainfall or irrigation. 
Um, we canned band application. Um, this will result in, in changes similar to what we see with anhydrous ammonia bands. Um, you know, seed placement of urea directly um, with the seed is probably not a good idea. And a lot of that has to do with the soil chemical changes that are going to occur right around those uh, urea granules. And, you know, we need to remember that urea is very soluble and it's susceptible to movement with water um, when it as exists as dissolved urea. So back to this equation real quick where we're looking at this conversion. Um, when we look at this, you know, the major process that we're interested in reducing is this hydrolysis or this conversion from urea to ammonium or ammonia via this urease enzyme. Um, I'm going to skip these here real quick. Um, so when we look at ammonia volatilization, um, you know, we've kind of developed some rules of urea application. Uh, we obviously want to apply to a dry soil surface and incorporate. Um, we want to use a urease inhibitor when recommended, and we'll cover um, those specific conditions here in a moment. Uh, when we look at the reasoning, you know, obviously ammonia gas volatilizes along with the evaporation of water from the soil surface. So you have to have that surface moisture in order for that evaporation to occur. And so anytime we can put out urea on a dry soil surface, um, the better off we're going to be in reducing that ammonia volatilization loss potential. Just as a reminder, you know, we want to incorporate urea so that when, as soon as we get your, can you hear me? Yeah, we're back. <laughs> okay. Um, so to kind of wrap up the talk, um, we're just going to talk about urease inhibitors uh, briefly. Um, you know, urease inhibitors and the, the predominant one that has been the most documented and well accepted as uh, truly uh, reducing uh, urea hydrolysis is NBPT. Um, and essentially, the way that NBPT works is it is a competitive inhibitor. And if you look at the shape of it, it's essentially kind of the same shape as urea. And so what it does is it actually gets into the urease enzyme and kind of locks it up to where um, the urea cannot be hydrolyzed via the enzyme. And so, you know, what we're doing with the urease inhibitors, we're essentially preventing this conversion uh, from urea uh, to ammonia or ammonium by blocking the activity of that urease um, enzyme. You know, typically urease inhibitors have only worked um, for a few days. Uh, but there's certainly being, you know, new improvements uh, made in that chemistry all the time. Um, when we look at, at liquid urease products, um, the majority of the research out there will tell you that you need to apply 0.08% uh, of NBPT by weight um, in order for that uh, uh, product to be effective. And it's typically going to have some type of control for anywhere from three to seven days. So I just want to show you some data of ammonia volatilizations. Uh, this would be a dry silt loam soil in Arkansas. Um, it's going to have a, a relatively high pH, somewhere about seven to seven and a half. You can see we have time after application on the x-axis, and we have ammonia volatilization uh, as a percent of nitrogen applied on the y-axis. Um, you can see here the red open. So am I good to keep going? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, so I want to draw your attention uh, to these black and green triangles where we had urea treated with agritane. Um, you know, the two key points that I think you need to take out of this are how we change the shape of this um, <clears throat> volatilization loss curve um, and the magnitude 
of the urea lost at the end of the trial. So not only are we delaying the hydrolysis of the urea, which leads to a reduction in the ammonia volatilization loss, we're also getting a significant reduction in the overall magnitude of that loss. And then we included um, ammonium sulfate in here. Um, you know, we do know that ammonium sulfate can lose um, some nitrogen via ammonia volatilization loss, but <clears throat> unlike urea, you know, ammonium sulfate is uh, an acidic forming fertilizer. And so, therefore, it doesn't really change the pH around the granules in a fashion um, that would lead to increased um, volatilization losses. And so, you know, one thing that's often done in a lot of places is, you know, they'll mix urea and ammonium sulfate to kind of get the benefits of, of both of those fertilizers. And I thought it was kind of interesting if we look at these open triangles here, um, you know, a lot of people get this impression that when they mix urea and ammonium sulfate, that the ammonium sulfate somehow reduces the ammonia loss from the urea. Um, and I would just like to point out that that is not the case. Um, if you look, we have urea here, and we have ammonium sulfate here, and we have the blend right here in the middle. So essentially 50% of this product is urea and 50% is ammonium sulfate. Well, the reason this line is right in the middle is because half of your product is urea. And so essentially you're getting the same ammonia volatilization loss from the urea. It's just, it is only 50% of the blend uh, that you're applying. Um, this is ammonia volatilization loss data uh, from a clay soil. And so you can see here we have our time after application on the X and volatilization as percent of applied nitrogen on the Y. Um, you know, the main reason I wanted to show you this particular situation is just the magnitude of ammonia loss that we get from a clay soil. And so going all the way out to 21 days, you know, on a clay soil without any urease inhibitors, we only lose about 15% of the nitrogen applied. And to remind you, you know, this is just a function of that cation exchange capacity that clay soils have. Um, you know, that increased ability to hold on to that ammonium when it's formed um, is what leads to this significant reduction um, in ammonia volatilization loss potential um, on those heavier textured soils. Um, here's just some further work, kind of looking at some different factors that are going to influence uh, ammonia volatilization loss. Um, graph is set up the same way, and what we're looking at here is essentially the, the soil conditions uh, when the urea was applied. So you can see here when we have muddy soil conditions, we're going to have a much greater potential for ammonia volatilization loss than when we take that same soil and we, and we apply it dry. Okay, sorry about that. Luckily, it wasn't my wife, so I didn't feel bad hanging up on them. Um, but you can see here that the difference in the magnitude of these losses is really just due to that difference um, in the soil moisture at the time of application, where we know that that soil moisture uh, is required for hydrolysis as well as the evaporative losses. And so, therefore, any time we apply it to a, a wet or moist soil, we're going to have a greater potential for loss. Um, what I'll kind of wrap up with is, you know, here at the University of Arkansas, we have a, a pretty extensive program to test um, urease inhibitors. Um, there's kind of a rule of thumb that I will tell you. You know, this is our list of, of recommended urease inhibitors. You know, I would say, you know, five 
to six years ago, there was only one product on this list. And due to changes in, you know, the way the product is made and, you know, different factors, this list has grown um, quite a bit over the past couple of years. You know, a lot of times we get asked, well, such and such product isn't on the list. What does that mean? Well, what I would say is that if a certain product is not on this list, it means one of three things. It means we either tested the product and it did not work. We are currently testing the product um, or we have never um, been asked to test the product. Um, so just because uh, a product is not on here does not mean that we don't um, recommend it because it didn't work. It, it means that we may not have ever tested it um, or we may be looking at a, a new formulation of a particular product. But, you know, this is the list that we currently recommend to our producers as far as showing effective um, inhibition of the urease enzyme and ultimately reducing ammonia volatilization loss potential. Um, the one thing that I would tell you is, you know, always make sure and check the percent NBPT um, or use recommended rates. Um, as a general rule, uh, if you have a 20% NBPT product, it's going to require about four quarts per ton to effectively reduce ammonia volatilization loss. Um, if you bump that concentration up to 26, then you can typically get by with three quarts per ton. Um, so, general rules of thumb on when to use a urease inhibitor. I think if you have low CEC soils, less than 20 centimoles of charge per kilogram, it's probably a good place to consider it. If you have moist soil conditions, probably a good place to consider it. If you're not going to incorporate either through mechanical or irrigation rainfall, probably a good consideration. If you're applying more than 100 pounds of N per acre, um, you know, typically in some of our splits that we apply to wheat, they're going to be less than 100 pounds per acre. And I think there is a, a true rate effect and a benefit that you get out of urease inhibitors when you apply higher rates. Um, but when you're putting out less than 100 pounds of product, uh, you're probably not losing uh, very much nitrogen via ammonia volatilization. Um, obviously, if the air temperature is, is greater than 70, uh, definitely consider it. And then windy conditions, uh, you know, that we get in the spring during application times can certainly exacerbate uh, that ammonia volatilization loss. Um, the last thing that I'll leave you with is, uh, you know, we have a University of Arkansas fact sheet um, on nitrogen fertilizer additives. Um, it includes both urease inhibitors and nitrification inhibitors. Um, it gets an overview of all the products that we currently test and recommend and kind of how, how we do that. Um, and I've included that link um, here at the bottom. Uh, Mark also, you know, has access to that and, and can share it uh, with you as needed. Um, I'm going to go ahead and leave this up in case anybody wants to write down um, this uh, URL for the, that fact sheet. And then with uh, Mark's assistance, I will try to answer any questions that you all might have.